Hi everybody, welcome to the November 3rd, 2017 edition of Colorado Inside Out. I'm your host, Dominic Dizzuti. Thank you very much for joining us. Let's get a quick take on the city of Denver reaching a $4.65 million settlement in the 2015 jail death of inmate Michael Marshall at the hands of sheriff's deputies. If approved by city council, the, sheriff, the Denver Sheriff's Department will also hire two mental health workers and implement new policies and training. Patty Calhoun from Westward, $4.65 million, $4 million is a lot of money. At some point, do the size of these settlements begin to impact the city of Denver? Well, they already have because we do have a new sheriff in place. I think the most important thing about this settlement, besides the fact that the city just made it without, didn't go to, didn't go to trial, and they just realized they had all the bad facts were on their side, hiring the two mental health workers to have them in the jail will definitely help the situation. Amy Cook from the Independence Institute joins us. Uh, Amy, you have a long history with law enforcement. You know your stuff here. When you see the new policies come down at the Sheriff's <laughs> Department, do you think they'll make a difference? Um, first of all, I just want to know why every time I'm on the show, it has to be something about law enforcement. <laughs> every time. Uh, every time. It's um, in the contract. That's what we do. If Amy's going to be on, that's what we do. Um, so, so two things. One is that I still think you need, Denver needs to elect a sheriff, and I'm going to say that every time. That's number one, because they're more accountable. That's number one. Number two is, um, Jails are not the place for to to be treating patients or people who need mental health. That's the real issue. We need resources for mental health before somebody gets into that situation. Otherwise, we're still we're still treating the symptom and not getting to the cause of what the these settlements where, where they're originating. We need more resources actually allocated to mental health in the community. Eric Solomon, political analyst. So when you uh, see 4.65 million dollars, when I think about that headline, maybe even not more than five years ago, that would have been huge news. That would have been topic one for the show. It would have been, oh my gosh, what the heck is happening? Now, I mean, right now it's our lightning round. It's, it, it doesn't seem that make of a deal. Are Denverites getting used to really huge settlements going out for these kinds of cases? I think it's sad, but I think the answer to your question is yes, that there is a, a degree of becoming inured to this kind of thing. Oh, here's one more, and a few months from now there'll be one more. Uh, I think the timing of this is probably particularly problematic for the city of Denver as thousands, tens of thousands of voters are sitting with their ballots on their kitchen table with this uh, the bond issue package mm -hmm. that Mayor Hancock wants. I suspect the bonds will still pass. That's what people do in Denver. They vote yes on these things. But, uh, but to see that kind of money spent time and time and time again, I think, uh, you know, makes some voters at least scratch their head and say, uh, where are our resources going? Real quickly, to Amy's point, yes, we should have mental health treatment well before these people land in jail. But once they are in jail, you wonder why we haven't had a few mental health professionals on the scene before this settlement came about. Ed Sealever from the Denver Business Journal rounds out the panel today. Ed, when you see these uh, huge settlements and also some of the policy changes implemented because of this particular one, do you think it's going to get the attention of either some other cities or even some folks on Capitol Hill? I don't know. I mean, because I think you can change every policy you want, but as long as you've still got 25% minimum of the Denver County jail population dealing with mental health issues, according to the Post numbers, it's not going to stop. I mean, you can, you can tell deputies to deal with this in as many ways, but they're not going to be ready for every situation that somebody who has a behavioral health issue has. I'm just going to double down on what both Amy and Eric said. You've got to get to these people first. You stop putting money into settlements. Start putting it into treatment start putting it into, for the worst cases, institutionalization. I mean, you got to get these folks off the streets where they can actually be in an atmosphere where people can help them rather than the jails, which aren't meant to be a place where people are supposed to be helped. Former congressman and veteran of this very roundtable, Tom Tancredo, announced this week that he'll be joining the already crowded 2018 Republican gubernatorial primary race. According to the Denver Post, Tancredo cons considers himself a shoe-in, stating his GOP nomination is, quote, a done deal, almost. It's nice to 
had a, had a little uh, humility there, Tom. Uh, he is the eighth candidate to join the 2018 Republican primary to date. Patty, just when we thought we were going to have another boring Republican primary, Tom Tancredo gives us an early Christmas present, and Floyd Cerulli, one of the uh, panelists who would sit next to him at this roundtable years ago, as you started the show, uh, actually did a poll and already shows Tancredo at 22%. Now, that might be his floor and his ceiling, but it already shows, at least in that poll, as a front runner. Do you think he is the front runner already? Well, with eight Republican candidates, 22% could make you the front runner. This is, of course, delicious for us at this roundtable. This is the third gubernatorial campaign of Tom Tancredo's we'll be able to talk about. The first he ran as an independent and wound up getting, what, 36% of the vote because Dan Mays was such a bad Republican candidate. The second time he did, he came in barely behind Bo Prey in the primary, but he also faced a lot of opposition there. There were four candidates, I think, then. Now we have eight. So you're splitting that pie much, much smaller. So if Tom's faithful, are really faithful, he can grab a few more, he could come away with the primary. The other thing is you have anybody is eligible to vote in the primary with our new amendment. So you could decide you're going to go vote Republican in that primary, not Democrat, not independent. And that allows for a lot of tricky maneuvering for those who think, hey, it would be great for Democrats who think, hey, or independents, hey, it'd be great to have Tancredo as the primary nominee because he's going to be harder. To, he's going to have a harder path with more centrist Coloradans in the final election. So there's a lot of opportunities and endless opportunities for us to talk about it here. I really do feel it's almost just a gift. You saw, hey, have I done anything for Cardo Inside Out lately? Well, here you go. Might be other, other rationale, but maybe that is. Uh, Amy, um, there's currently eight candidates in the gubernatorial primary race uh, for the, uh, the Republican Party. Uh, I will admit I'm a uh, political junkie. I love getting into it. I love uh, uh, my friends and family will ask me about politics. But even when I looked at the pictures of all eight candidates, I was stumped on a couple. So how many of those eight get to, let's say, next March, when the real uh, heat begins to come on, when it's three months before the primary? What do you think uh, is our contingent at that point, and is Tancredo still the front runner? Well, good questions, and also um, that might be, we should do a game show. <laughs> Name all eight Republican <laughs> candidates. <laughs> are, are you smarter than a political junkie? Now, um, um, That's a really easy question. Yes, of course, <laughs> people are, yes, but you, go ahead. Almost everybody is. Um, you know, you'll start to see some weeding out, but the, the thing is, um, some of these have, have nothing to lose by staying in because they, they're not, I, I, I mean, it's not like they're raising a lot of money and they're not really spending a lot of money. They are there, they can take one or two points away from somebody who might be a proverbial front runner and then, which I actually think in a, in a four, six way race, Tom Tancredo has an excellent opportunity simply by his sheer name recognition. And the other thing is he has the policy chops. I mean, he is a guy who's been around, he knows policy. Everybody knows his stance on many things. So, so that idea of that, that uh, I'm not certain he could do, there could be some kind of uh, October or March surprise that would, <laughs> that would doom a Tancredo uh, candidacy. He, it, it, and I think he also, I think that um, he forces the other candidates to be a little bolder, a little more interesting. I, I feel like they've been playing prevent defense for the last few months and that they will now have to go out and actually come up with, with stronger strategies um, to actually go on offense and win. I think Tom Tancredo forces them to do that. Eric, uh, back in 98 when Tancredo won his uh, seat for Congress in CD6, uh, you would know for sure, um, my memory tells me that I think it was a five-way primary, and that was the contributor. There, it, it wasn't, there wasn't really a big front runner, but he's able to make his way. He, he has a, a long political career here in Colorado, so people have known him for a long time. What effect does Tancredo's entry to this primary make on the rest of the primary race? Well, it certainly shakes it up. It changes the dynamics in ways bo both good for the Republicans and that it attracts attention, but ultimately I think harmful and damaging to Republicans. Uh, I keep thinking we've seen this play before with Tom, and we have seen it. This is the third gubernatorial election in a row. It doesn't end happily. The, 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 this play doesn't have a happy ending for Tom Tancredo. It doesn't have a happy ending for the Republican Party. I'm starting to think that running for office is just what Tom does. 
it's, you know, later in his career, this is who he is. And every four years, he will find, sometimes every two years, he will find something to, to, to run for. I, I do think ultimately this becomes a nightmare for Republicans in a multi-party, I mean, a multi-candidate kind of race. He has every opportunity to win it. Now, we still haven't heard from one potential candidate, that being Cynthia Kaufman, and that would also shake up and change uh, dynamics. So that could be a ninth entrant and a, another serious one um, in this race. I, I saw Channel 4 on their website the other day had a headline saying, Tancredo denies being white supremacist. When you are forced to, I mean, when that kind of issue is start, where press gets traction, where this primary election is going to be fought, that is not where Republicans want to be. The Republican Party, since they've sort of been in troubled straits in this state, since really 2002, 2004, when the state started dramatically shifting complexion, the Republican Party has given away so many elections by picking the wrong candidate. And there's every potential here that this will be another one. So Ed, clearly Tom Tancredo has an advantage comes the anti-establishment. He's already used a, a variation of Donald Trump's. Uh, Even though saying, he's the most established candidate in the race. <laughs> exactly. Go ahead. Yes. No. Dripping with yes. irony. Yes, it, it is. I, I will absolutely give you that. Uh, but does, I guess, either the establishment or moderates, whatever you want to call it in the Republican Party that don't want to see Tom Tancredo take this race where it's going to go after primary, do they begin to try to coalesce around a candidate, whether it is drafting Cynthia Coffin, whether it's Walker Stapleton, whether it's George Brockler or somebody else. Do you think uh, because the Republican Party in Colorado really isn't all that anti-establishment that they begin to coalesce around somebody as another answer? Yeah, I actually do think that's a possibility. I was going to try to throw some water on everybody's feelings that Tancredo is about to cruise to the uh, to the primary win here. I mean, you think about it. Just two years ago, two years ago, that's the not two years ago, last year. That's the Trump wave. That's when the anti-establishment came forward. Trump got zero Colorado delegates. In fact, the Colorado delegates tried to lead a, a revolt at the Republican National Convention against Trump. Now, I mean, we were for Ted Cruz in this state, who isn't by any chance an establishment candidate, but completely mainstream compared to. Trump. And so it gives you this sense that maybe Colorado is not caught up in this national wave of populism that has sent Trump into uh, into the position he's in right now. The other thing I will say, and I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon, but we've seen this in primaries before, uh, from state level down to mayoral primaries. If somebody realizes that they are not going to win this and that their being in there could take seven to ten points away from somebody and catapult someone they really don't want to be the nominee, you could see them drop out. Now, I'm not going to point fingers and say whether that's going to be George Brockler, Walker Stapleton, Doug Robinson, um, but but come that critical time, you might see one of those pull out, endorse another one, and throw some momentum behind the anti-tank credo wave. So yeah, I, I think this is far from a fait accompli. In fact, I think he's still got a big hurdle to cross to get that nomination. Governor John Hickelooper submitted his 2018 budget proposal this week. He made headlines by asserting that retirees and state employees using PARA should be on the hook for the cost of the changes to the program and making up for a projected shortfall, not taxpayers. Amy, I was surprised to hear uh, Governor Hickenlooper's comments about PARA, the budget we were expecting that he got to fire the first proposal, but were you surprised to hear his comments? Well. Yeah, I was surprised that uh, he said taxpayers shouldn't be on the hook. I give him credit for that. Still, we have a long way to go to make Para even remotely solvent, but at least he's not looking at taxpayers to bail out all of, you know, to, to bail out Para. Para needs a, a lot more reform than just saying, you know, taxpayers are going have to have to bail it out or not. Um, what shocked me more about that budget, though, not a single word about about um, fixing roads. I, I, I'm like, that was such a big play all last year, and now we have money. There's there we've got a thirty billion dollar budget, and you don't see anybody saying we're going to start bonding for roads. So, I think while Para was a huge surprise in that he said taxpayers shouldn't be on the hook, I also think the surprise was in the omission. Maybe there's a more powerful tire and alignment store lobby that we don't know about <laughs> that is uh, really hitting there. Eric, um, were you surprised to see what the stance that Governor Hickenlooper made? And do you think that we only see a stance like this when we know he's no longer governor, a governor in just a short amount of time? 
I'm not going to opine on his motives. I really don't understand it. Yes, I was a little surprised, but very pleasantly surprised. It was a bold stance on Governor Hickenlooper's part to really sort of put down that marker. It was a message to fellow, re fellow Democrats in the legislature. Full disclosure here, I work with a group called Secure Futures Colorado. They're sort of the lead group pushing meaningful, substantial, uh, structural para reform. This is going to be perhaps issue number one in the coming legislative session. The deck sort of got cleared last year with construction defects and with hospital provider fee and whatever. Para is in a mess. Para, by previous law, they have to annually publish their signal lights, which is sort of like the Department of Homeland Security, you know, state of alert. But all five divisions of Para are in the orange category in terms of funding. So Para is forced to come to the legislature with a proposed fix. This will be a very heavy issue in this session. I assume it will not be the last time we talk uh, about it around this table. Quickly. You know, the, uh, yes, there is uh, just an issue of solvency and down the road uh, ability to pay all these bills. Not short term, they certainly have plenty of money to pay their obligation short term. But there are other issues that move me as much. One is, it is just a model that is not adapted to the current generation of workers. The, the old notion that you start a job at age 24, 25, you retire 35 years later from the same employer, you get a sheet cake on the way out the door. That doesn't happen, uh, you know, the, our, our kids' generation, that is just not the, the, the coming pattern. And increasingly this state, whether it's roads that Amy mentioned or anything else, pension debt is crowding everything else out of the budget. And whatever your interest is, it is getting crowded out by the more and more money we continue to put into funding this pension debt. Ed, uh, you're a guy in Capitol Hill. How do you think this go goes down? What's going to be the response from lawmakers, especially since we have another year of a split legislature? I was amazed at how silent lawmakers were after the uh, the proposal came out on Wednesday. In fact, the only response we've really seen is the one that Amy mentioned earlier, the Senate Republicans being quite upset that there's no general fund money going to transportation, um, although they came out and said, we're pretty pleasantly p surprised at what he's done with para, and we think this is a pretty decent idea. I I think it was really interesting the way that Governor Hickenlooper phrased it is he didn't say I don't want to stick the taxpayers with more obligations, he said I don't want to stick the employers with more obligations. Now the employers in this case are public employers, they're the state, they're the school systems, things like that. But he's almost framing that in a way in which he seems to be really wanting to get the Republicans on his side here and to get moderate Democrats on his side as well, saying this is not just a you know tax issue, this is almost a, an employer versus uh, the, the state issue. I don't know quite frankly how this is going to go down, but I think Hickenlooper can feel rest assured in this, that the Senate itself is not going to come in and say, I'm sorry, Governor, we really want to charge taxpayers slash employers more money. And so I think that's the card he's starting out with here. He's almost telling his own party, who again were the ones that were very silent on the budget, here's what I give you. You try to see if you can do better than this. And in this case, they probably won't. They know that. They couldn't do better with transportation funding last year. Uh, and, um, and, and I think it's going to lead to a very interesting battle. But I think this is going to be just one of many battles around this budget. Patty, what do you think? Should state retirees and employees right now be a little worried about the situation? Well, I think they're definitely going to be worried they're going to lose some of that pension, which is better than losing all of the pension. Para, para definitely needs to be fixed. But it's interesting because Hickenlooper's a lame duck. He doesn't have to make the taxpayers happy. So he took what he felt was the right way to fix this. I mean, three years ago, yes, he would have, when he was running against Tom Tancredo, he might have had to do that. <laughs> now, the Democrats who are in the legislature, they're the ones who are going to have to worry about what the taxpayers think. So it'll play better with them to go with the governor with his current stance than to side with the unions, go against the employers. But I have to say, it's not just people going into government now who stay there 30 years. People who stay in private industry for 30 years, they're not even getting the sheet cake, the cake much less the <laughs> pension. So a lot of people there are not going to be, a lot of people in the state are not going to be that sympathetic to the state employees. Election Day 2017 is just four days away, and a little over 600,000 mail-in ballots have already been turned in across the state. City council races, school board races, mayoral races, and a major bond initiative in Denver are all in the hands of voters. Registered Republicans have turned in the majority of ballots so far, and voters between the ages of 18 and 25 have turned in just over 20,000 ballots so far. 
Uh, Eric, uh, voters between 18 and 25 really not tuning in, or voting early in an off-year election is not a surprising headline. But from what we've seen so far, have you seen any surprises? And what do you think the headlines say that we talk about next Friday? Because all those voters between 18 and 25 are tuned into this show. That's our, Absolutely. It's, our, it's our core demographic, <laughs> as we all know. They're waiting to vote until they hear from us. <laughs> then, then, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I don't know what the headline is next Friday. I really, truly don't. I think the, uh, the races that have captivated uh, and dominated this election are the school board races. Yes, the Denver bond is very consequential, and there are other local issues around the state, but whether it's Douglas County or Denver in particular, I know there's a hot race up in Greeley as well, but it's these school board races between, quote, reformers and between union establishment types that have dominated, and they have... Uh, there's a level of anger on all sides, a, a level of vitriol that I haven't seen in these school board races before. I don't know what happens in Denver. I have a strong opinion. I'm a part of the Choice Charter, um, the, 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 the Bozberg Bennett plan of, of how you improve an urban school district, and I think it has worked. But um, how this outcome, what the outcome is uh, Tuesday next week, I don't know. Our po politics in this country have become so polarized. Now that polarization is extended even down to the level of school board next to the big dog catcher. <laughs> well, certainly. Uh, Ed, does the average Colorado know how much business is going to get decided by next Tuesday? Uh, I don't think they do. Now, I think people are going to be focused in on their, I, I'm going to go away from the school boards and go to the municipal elections. I think people are going to be focused in on their municipal elections and maybe, you know, who they know, what this can mean for the city. But I think there's a huge story that's brewing here. That's something I wrote about about a week ago. And that is the number of kind of growth versus anti-growth races that are happening in suburbs around the Denver area. You see that in Lakewood. You see that in Westminster. You see that in Greenwood Village. And, and I should say people don't want to be referred to as anti-growth. They want to be referred to as slow growth. But, um, but, but this is really going to tell us where people want to go. I mean, we've had such a population explosion over the last six years, uh, even longer than that. But it's really hit home in the last few election cycles. And now people are saying, look, I, I don't want to see, you know, towering apartments going up in my city. I don't want to see these crowded, more dense areas. And, and the, the trick is a lot of people are saying, well, if, you know, Lakewood says we don't want to see these, then they're just going to move out into unincorporated. Jefferson County. If Greenwood Village says this, they're just going to move farther down, possibly into Douglas County. Um, but if there is a, a big push to get these slow growth, no growth candidates in office in these elections, uh, I think you're going to see that extend to 2018 when there could be a potential state ballot initiative uh, that looks to limit growth in front range counties. Wow. Patty, where do you think the GO initiative goes for Denver? Well, to go off from what Ed was saying, I think you also have a smart or no growth group in Denver, which do isn't paying money to really campaign against the go bonds, but just the way people were split, they didn't want to see Amazon go there. There is opposition to the bonds, so we'll have to see, will it go the way Denver always says, oh, we still love the city, we're going to pay to make it better, or will people say, we are tired of this? And I think we might have a few of those go down. The school board one, the school board ugliness is just beyond belief, though. Amy, wrap it up for us. Well, um, to, to Eric's point, anger and vitriol in school board races, I, I would also throw in there the amount of money that is going, being thrown at some of these local elections, which tells you that there is a level of power that is perceived in these. I think you're going to see a fatigue. I, I, I don't know how they turn out, but I think you're going to see fight and voter fatigue. And what that means for parents is I think you'll start to see if, for instance, um, anti-choice candidates win in places like Douglas County or in Denver, I think you're going to start seeing a migration even more so away from traditional public schools as people want choice. They want choice in education. And if those, if, if people in positions of power don't allow that, I think you're going to see, you're going to see uh, K-12 education, a dramatic shift. Let's get to our favorite part of the show rather quickly. Disgrace of the week, as always. Ms. Cahoon, please start us off. Not a disgrace so much. It's just another tragedy in Colorado, the shooting at Walmart. Mm -hmm. Amy. Uh, Governor Hickenlooper says coal is no longer the low-cost fuel and says wind is cheaper. What he misses is dis he's totally disingenuous. It's transforming that source into electricity that makes it costly. Eric. Well, related to the school board races and the discussion we just had, there is a really tired canard out there. Wherever you come down on what side of this debate, the canard is that somehow charter schools are not public schools. 
they are public schools. They're paid for with taxpayer money. They are every bit as public in that sense as the school down the street. And it is time, people know better, and it is time we put that canard to rest. Yeah. There's some people at the Capitol who have called the Regional Tourism Act the worst program ever enacted by the state. An audit this week may give them great backing, showing that the program was run without oversight and m awards of you know 400 plus million were made really without justification in some instances. The awards are done from this program, and I think people want to put this in the grave and move on from it. Time to say something nice about somebody, Patty. It's Denver Arts Week. Turn off your TV, get to a gallery, after or go to show. a mu after the show. <laughs> well, the show's over. It's true. Turn off the TV, <laughs> go to a gallery, and tomorrow night all the museums are free. That's a good point. I'm not sure if John Kildare appreciated that we say turn off TV now, but you know what? So, <laughs> baby. I want to say something nice about Patty Calhoun for hiring Krista Kafer to do your wine and spirits column. Nobody better than Krista to do that. You're here. Eric. I didn't know that. I love that. But uh, for my say something nice, it's easy. Uh, my mother, a loyal viewer of this show for many years, had her 90th birthday earlier this week. We all gathered to celebrate. Happy birthday, Marion Sonderman. Happy birthday, Marion. Fantastic. Ed. Uh, Britta Erickson, the film festival head at the Denver Film Society, has put together a fascinating package of films. And his expanded offerings include things like virtual reality and go on a date with an actor to draw more people in. She's doing a great job over there. <laughs> that is all the time we have for this edition of Car to Inside Out. As always, log on to Facebook or Twitter for our CIO segments, past and present. You can also find our podcast if you're looking for it before we had a little bit of troubles with some servers. It is back. It's back on iTunes and Google Play, so be sure to check that out. And again, just one more big thanks for last week and everybody's support for our big Car to Inside Out 25 years documentary all about the show. If you missed it, you've been hearing about it, where do I find it? It's on our website, cpt12.org. Be sure to check it out. It's a lot of fun to do. For everybody here at Colorado Public Television, I'm Dominic Dizzuti. Thank you very much for watching. Good night.